Hello, uh, lots of familiar faces and um, introduce myself. I'm Judy Clem. I'm the executive director of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. And I'd like to welcome you all this evening, um, this hot, hot evening in Oak Park and the surrounding area. Um, so we're here tonight to learn about um, how to prepare gardens for fall. And we'll introduce our speaker in just a minute, but I just wanna share a couple of um, announcements with you first. And um, just remind you that the friends of the Oak Park Conservatory are here to help you um, become it's inspired and more confident as you um, go into your gardens and pursue your gardening endeavors. And so we do lecture series like this, um, tonight's program. I wanna plug a couple of upcoming programs that we have. Be sure to look for our upcoming talk on hydrangeas. It's gonna be all about hydrangeas, a deep dive. And we have a fantastic presenter for that coming in September. And then in October, just in time for Halloween, we have a program coming up on carnivorous plants. So we're very excited about that. And you should know that the Oak Park Conservatory has a fantastic collection um, and sometimes we even sell them. So um, that is coming up in October. Another few things we wanna mention, our fall plant and tool exchange will be happening on September 10th. So it's an opportunity for you to bring your plants, your tools and swap them with other gardeners. And um, also an exciting thing we're bringing back on Wednesdays from one to 3 p.m. beginning September 6th, we are bringing back the Plant Care Help Desk. And that is an opportunity for you to stop in at the conservatory, bring your plants, ask your questions, just drop in. You can also email us, we'll have an email um, uh, address available for people. Um, this is something that we offered. It was very popular. We offered it before the pandemic and we just haven't been able to get the program up and running until now. So we are very excited um, to offer that again. So tap into the expertise that's available to you from the Friends and the Oak Park Conservatory. And also um, starting tomorrow, you'll see on the slides that are um, flipping through here, um, the Oak Park Conservatory is running the um, fall mum and bulb sale. Uh, the online sales begin tomorrow and the mums are filling the back of the conservatory. They are going to be gorgeous. They will be huge, um, perfect for your um, beautification of your home and to switch out those um, fading flowers that you may have, especially after today. Um, there will also be easy to grow tulips, daffodils and other rare to find naturalizing perennial favorite bulbs. So those are my announcements. Uh, we have a lot going on and um, please get involved and stay connected with us. So now um, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, our special guest this evening. Um, and hopefully she has cooled off from her work this morning. Um, Jen Suzek is the horticulture supervisor for the Park District of Oak Park, where she oversees the care of 25 properties in Oak Park owned by the Park District. She attended the College of DuPage and received a degree in horticulture. And um, she grew up 80 miles south of Chicago in a farming community and has been gardening her whole life. So um, I also wanna mention that Casey Nikoloff is with us this evening. She is my co-host and managing the chat. And um, please put your questions in the Q&A box and um, we will reserve some time after the discussion um, with Jen to try to answer as many questions as we have. So without further ado, um, Jen, are you ready to roll and share your screen with us? I am. Thank you, Judy, for that introduction. And hello, everyone. I'm sure I know a lot of you. I'm sure I've seen you around the conservatory. Um, and if not, I hope to in the future, you'll probably see me around the parks. I'm usually outside a lot. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get my presentation started for you. Okay. Okay. So our topic tonight, as Judy said, is a fall gardening checklist for the home gardener. And I am really excited to present this tonight with the hot weather. I'm sure we're all thinking about fall and ready to be outside, maybe with a flannel on or a sweatshirt um, and get out of this heat. So it's pretty exciting to think about these topics and talk about them with you all. One moment, please. There we go. So a little bit about me, as Judy said, I grew up downstate about 80 miles south of the city 
and I have been gardening my whole life. Uh, it's really a passion for me. Some of my earliest memories are in the garden with my family. Um, I grew up, our house was on about eight acres of land. We had a big garden and an apple orchard. And I remember planting and picking potatoes with my grandpa. That's one of my earliest memories. Um, I'm the horticulture supervisor for the park district. Um, as Judy said, we have 25 parks and facilities around town that we manage. We do all of the perennial plantings and the tree care. Those are the primary things that I focus on. Um, I have a bachelor's in biology and I'm actually still working on that associates. Um, I'll probably continue taking classes when I'm done because you're all here tonight to learn. Gardeners are always learning. Um, and I'm really excited in November, I will be a certified arborist if I pass the exam, which I definitely will. And I love my job. Um, it's a great joy to be able to do what you love every day and get paid for it. And I get to serve my community and it, I really, and doing things like this really adds to that. Um, this is an example of some of the work we've done around town. Um, on the left here, you can see some plantings we put in at Austin Gardens. That's my crew down there working at Scoville, um, some beautiful hydrangeas and some annuals we did in the early spring, some of our cool weather work. Um, before I get started with our checklist, I wanna talk a little bit about my gardening philosophy and where I come from. Um, I really like talking about home gardening. I really like telling people about it. I really like encouraging people to do it. Um, so a little bit about where I come from before I tell you my ideas and thoughts about our fall garden. Um, when you're gardening, I think you should embrace all the seasons. It's really hot right now. Think about winter and enjoy the heat for today if you can. Um, and, and even gardeners, all, most gardeners I know they enjoy winter. That's our downtime, that's our rest time. Um, each season has a beauty to it. Embrace that, go with the flow make make it a, a your garden can have four seasons and I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight too work with nature instead of fighting against nature um is your yard dry plant plants that are dry don't try to have a water garden it's not going to work um do you have a lot of shade you know go with what works for you don't constantly fight you're going to make yourself miserable um make your garden yours um, plant the plants you like don't let anybody tell you what plants to plant um, with the one rule, please don't plant any invasives. Uh, <laughs> anything else, you enjoy it, you plant it. Um, take some time out to enjoy your garden. Uh, don't constantly work. Sit back, look around, look at the bugs, get into it. You made this for you. This is your home. Sit back and enjoy it. Imperfect gardens are okay. This garden here, you know, maybe it's not going to be on the cover of Better Homes and Gardens magazine, but it's beautiful to me you can have a small garden. You know, maybe you only have a patio. Don't let that deter you from having a garden. Garden with your family. Um, it, accept that you're gonna have some weeds. It's not gonna look perfect and let it bring you joy. So tonight I came home, I wanted to cook supper. I went out, I got some tomatoes and I made a pasta sauce. That brought me a lot of joy. You know, do whatever brings you joy. If that's flowers, trees, vegetables, a variety whatever makes you happy. So that being said, into our topic for tonight. So these are the topics that I'm going to cover. This is um, a rough checklist that you can follow in your garden. Um, this is not meant to cover all of the topics. Um, if something in here it maybe ignites an interest in you, um, you can reach out to me or Judy. We might plan another lecture that can dive deeper into these. And also remember, you can look back on the BogCon website. They have a lot of the old lectures there. Um, you can see if any of these topics are maybe delved into a little deeper there. Um, so again, an overview, mostly for a home gardener, maybe an amateur gardener, but as I found, a lot of home gardeners really are very knowledgeable. Um, one moment, please. Okay, so the first task on our checklist is dividing plants. Um, why would we divide our plants? And when I say plants here, I mean perennial plants. So why would we divide them? Well, um, once they start to get too big, they can crowd each other out for nutrients, water. Um, the roots might be getting kind of too tight, too tangled. 
Um, they might be in a place you don't really like them. You might want to move them. You can make new plants. Um, this is going to be your, I have to move this part out of my screen one moment. So you are going to be um, divide, in the fall is the time to divide your spring and summer blooming plants. Um, and those are going to be plants with fleshy roots like your peonies, your iris. And in this picture, you can see these are hostas that they're dividing. Hostas are pretty hardy. They're ideally divided in the spring. However, if you divide them in the fall, they're probably going to do okay. Um, but if you want, you can wait and do these in spring. You're going to divide your uh, these plants, these perennials, four to six weeks before the ground freezes. That'll give them ample time to, to develop a new root system. When you divide them, I wouldn't do it on a hot day like this. Pick a cooler day, maybe do it in the evening. Um, you don't wanna shock your plants too much. So the process for dividing your plants is you're gonna dig out the clump with a, splay, with a spade, excuse me, and you can gently divide it with your hands or you can use a fork. Now, if the roots are really thick and really tangled, you might need to use a knife um, and that's fine too. Each piece that you divide should have three to five shoots and a good amount of roots still attached. And then you can replant as desired and water these really well. Our next topic on our checklist is lifting dahlias and canas. Um, these are not perennials in our zone. They are perennials in certain areas of the country, but not here, our zone is 6A. If you want to use these again, you have to dig them out each year and store them properly. Um, and you can see here, this is what canis look like. Um, they're, they're pretty common. They can even be grown in pots or directly in the ground. And this is what canis look like. They have a rhizomatous root. And you can see that they're fairly, um, they're, excuse me, they're different actually than dahlias, but the process for dividing them is very similar. And dahlias are really a lovely cut flower. Um, and they are, they're, they're usually grown more in the ground than in pots. So for these, what you'll be doing, oops, excuse me, push the wrong button there. So for the canas and the dollies, you're gonna wait for the first frost, but not after the soil is frozen. You can cut back the foliage on these and they can cure in the ground. And what the curing process does is it helps thicken that skin so that they can be stored for winter without getting damaged. Um, you're gonna use a fork after they have cured in the ground you can use a fork to dig up these roots. Um, if you don't have a fork, that's okay. Don't go and buy a fork. Use a spade, just be extra careful. Then you're gonna be removing the soil from these, but you don't wanna scrub it because if you scrub it, you're gonna be taking off that skin and it's not gonna be as protected for the winter storage. Then you're gonna put it in a ventilated place to dry and you can store these in peat moss, crates, boxes, or bags in a cool, dry, and ventilated area. Um, I've used my basement before. Uh, if you have a dry basement, that would be a good idea. Um, you know, you don't want it too cold, too hot. Um, so if your basement's dry, that's probably the best place, place to put them. Okay, next topic on our checklist is bulbs. In the fall, you'll be doing your spring flowering bulbs. So those are your daffodils, your tulips, and your crocus. Um, I love planting bulbs, especially, you know, when you're in the fall and it's like, it's like a little present to yourself for springtime. So you take this weird looking thing, you stick it under the ground and then in spring, it's like, wow. And whenever I see a garden with bulbs in it, I like that gardener thought ahead. They were thinking oh, in spring, I want all these bulbs because it's really, it shows your patience as a gardener that you plant this all the way, maybe, you know, in October and this is going to spring, you know, develop in the spring, April, May, something like that. And don't forget about garlic too. You plant garlic in the fall. I'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about vegetable garden. Um, so for each of your bulbs, you're gonna do the correct depth and orientation. Um, usually that will say it on the package. Um, if your bulb didn't come with a package, look that up. It's different for each type of bulb. Late September through early November. Um, I have heard people say they put these in when the ground is frozen and it still works, but um, you know, not before the ground is frozen is your best bet. You can use a variety of tools to dig your bulbs. I'll go over the tools in just a moment, a little bit more in depth. So these are the most common bulbs that you can plant in the fall. And what I like about this chart is it shows how they bloom all at different times. Um, 
one great goal in my garden is to have something blooming all throughout the year. Uh, one item here that I found really helped me were these alliums. Um, generally after the tulip bulbs, the flowers senesce, you're left with a lot of green foliage and your summer blooming perennials really haven't started blooming yet. Um, the alliums really fill in that gap nicely. And the alliums also, after they're, the flower senesce, it leaves this beautiful seed head. And I think it adds a really nice interest through the whole summer into the garden. So I really recommend planting alliums. Um, I like all of these bulbs though. I, I think they're, they're a really nice way to add uh, spring color to your garden. And they're also great for pollinators. It gives them food all throughout the season, which we know is really important. So here are some of the tools you can use to plant bulbs. Now, if you're planting, you know, one small package of bulbs, just use a hand trowel. I always think in gardening, simplest is best. The old fashioned tools are usually the best method. This hand trowel that you can see here, it even has measurements on it. So you can, you know, check your depth for your bulbs. That's the handiest tool you can have for the garden, hands down all tasks, especially for bulb gardening. Um, these other tools are really useful though if you are gonna be planting a lot of bulbs, if you have a big project you wanna do. This one um, would not be great, the one on the far left here, it is not great for really hard or compacted soil, but if you have soft soil, that's gonna work great. That's just a basic bulb planter. You just twist it in the ground, it creates a hull, and then you put your bulb inside. This is a spade with kind of a narrow rounded tip, great for making those. This is an auger, which attaches to a handheld drill. I have one of these at home. It's a really handy tool. This photo shows this person using it right directly in their turf. I haven't found great success with using it directly in turf. It gets a little hung up. I think it's good for medium, medium compacted soil. Um, and this is similar to the handheld tool but it has a little step plate here, which is handy for getting a little bit more pressure. It's gonna be easier on your back. Again, don't spend the money on these tools unless you're gonna use them and enjoy them. Stick with your hand trowel, can't go wrong. Okay, next topic on our checklist is leaf and debris cleanup. Um, some people hate this task. They don't wanna think about it. They hate the leaves, it's awful. Some people enjoy this task. I've heard people, they say they wanna rake their leaves. They think it's a joy. Um, so we have a, a variety of ways to deal with the leaves um, that I hope will work in your garden. So we've also heard people talk about leave the leaves and what are the benefits to that? Well, I leave the leaves in my garden and the benefits to that is it provides organic matter to my garden. It can harbor insects that are beneficial that may want to overwinter in that material. If I break that material down and put it on my garden, that's adding nutrients and the organic matter that I talked about from before. Um, one exception I'll say here is that if you have diseased plant material, you're always gonna remove that. And how will you know it's diseased? You may not know. If you suspect it, get rid of it. If you have a confirmed diseased tree, get rid of those leaves. Uh, you do not wanna spread disease to any other trees in your yard. So what can we do with this leaf matter? Well, this picture on the right is just a photo I took of some leaves that I thought were really pretty and you can see the dew drops there. I'll say if you leave entire leaves that are wet in your garden, it's gonna form a very thick mat and that is not what you wanna do. If you just leave those leaves like that in your garden, when spring comes, nothing will be able to rise through that. Um, so whenever we're using leaves in our garden, we're gonna to wanna to break them down somehow. You can see on the left, this is what broken down leaves look like. So what can you do with these broken down leaves? Well. You know, I listed out some options here. So our our worst option for leaves is putting them in a black plastic bag and setting them out to go to a landfill. It's the worst thing we can do with our garden and for the environment. And again, that's not working with nature. The tree dropped those leaves. It's good for the tree. Let's try to leave them there. If you need to let them out for yard waste, you could put them in the brown paper bags. A lot of municipalities have a compost program. So maybe those are getting used. If that's an option, you really need to get rid of these leaves and you really don't wanna deal with them. You can compost them. Um, composting is a whole other thing that we could talk about a lot. Um, if you put them in your compost bin, you're still gonna to wanna to break them down. You're still gonna maybe wanna mix them with some other matter. Um, but you can see a simple 
a very simple method to compost them right here that you can do. And those will still break down over winter and you can still use them in your garden. They can be used as mulch, just like this, broken down. They could be spread all around your plants. They can also be used as a lawn amendment. Again, you're always gonna wanna shred them down. And here we see some other, uh, these are perennials that have you know faded for the year. Do you clean them up or do you leave them? Now in my garden at home, I leave them. Uh, I think, you know, hydrangea heads like that with snow on it, I think it's really pretty. Um, again, these can harbor beneficial insects over the winter and you can clean that up in spring. If you're gonna clean it up in the fall, you know, go ahead and treat it just like you would the, the leaf matter that you, from the trees. Here are some tools for helping you with that. So these are the fancier tools, um, a mulching mower, uh, this type of mower, once you get the leaves out, you can just mow right over them. They will go into your garden. They'll add some lovely nutrients to your lawn. Then you've worked with nature, provided some nutrients for your lawn, and you haven't had to do as much work. Um, even just most regular lawn mowers will uh, break up leaves pretty well. And we actually do this at the park district. We work with the mowing crew and we might call them and say, you know, I need to remove a lot of leaves from this area. Can you come and mow today? And they'll work with us and do that. That's really nice. A leaf blower, not necessary, really comes in handy. I don't have one at home, but I really would like to get one. Um, it's really nice to push all the leaves in one area and then maybe you wanna mow them over. Um, get them all in one area without, you know, maybe raking them if you have a really big yard or a lot of leaves. Um, and you can get a little chipper shredder for your home. I don't have one, but I've been hoping to save some money and get one. You can see this lady here, she's putting some sticks in. I mean, this is really cool. Then you don't have to put your sticks out. You trimmed a tree, you can make your own mulch, you can make your own wood chips for paths. Um, you can put leaves in some of these, chip them up, shred them up. Pretty, pretty nifty. Uh, good old spring rake and elbow grease. That's my go-to method. You can't go wrong. And uh, it's really fun to rake leaves, in my opinion. And children are great leaf shredders. So this is actually what I do in my garden every year. These are my children. And I rake out my beds, which are back here, some of my beds. I put the leaves in the yard and I go to my neighbors and I say, hey, can I have your leaves? And they usually say, yes, please. And I rake their yard. I put all their leaves in my yard and my children jump on it and the pile starts up here and, you know, it's a couple inches tall by the time they're done jumping in it. And after they jump in it a few times, I rake it right back into the garden. And then in spring, I take a look. Has it broken down enough? Okay, I just leave it. If it hasn't broken down enough, I rake it back out into the lawn and I mow it over. And that brings us to our next topic on the checklist, and that is the lawn. Um, I am not a lawn expert. It's not the area of my yard I really focus on. Um, but I, I have a lawn, we probably all have a lawn. Um, this is a beautiful green manicured lawn. I don't have a beautiful green manicured lawn. Um, I enjoy doing other types of gardening, but I do like a lawn. I do like an area for my kids to play, my dog to run around. And so here are the basics of what you're gonna do in the fall for your lawn. Um, so your grass is gonna stop growing when the daytime temperatures are less than 50 degrees. And you're gonna take a look at the calendar. Our last frost, I believe is usually in October and you're gonna progressively cut it shorter. And you could do that over like two or three times. You want the grass to be as short as possible without really scalping it to the ground, which it turns out to be about half an inch below the normal mowing height, which is usually about two inches. And you can look at mother nature for your clue on when to stop mowing. And once about 90% of the leaves have fallen off the trees, you know that your garden is probably or excuse me, your lawn is probably not gonna grow very much anymore and you can uh, stop mowing at that point. All right, next task on our checklist is taking a look at your trees and your shrubs. Uh, one of the great things that you can do in the fall, I don't know if people think about this very much, is you can plant. It's a great time to plant. It's cool out. Um, it's not gonna shock our trees as much. We usually plant in the spring and the fall. Um, so I have a couple pictures here. The picture at the top is my work crew. And this was the planting we did in the spring, late spring, as you can see from the picture. And the bottom is my home crew. And that was some planting we did a few years ago. And uh, I think 
they planted it a little close to the fence, but you know, they were trainees. So I cut them a little slack on that. Um, a great time to plant is mid August to mid October. I would say veer toward more towards the September, October, especially if August is hot. Um, you, you don't want to plant trees in hot weather. Um, species best for fall planting are listed there. Some do better planted in the fall, some do better planted in the spring. Take a look at your list. And a great time about great thing about planting in the fall too is sometimes nurseries are having sales. They want to maybe get rid of some stock for winter. Um, maybe you can find some of these trees and plant them at your home. Um, you have to water your newly planted trees, but you can stop when the temperatures get below 40 degrees consistently. And if you have any established trees on your property, fall is a good time to fertilize them. If needed, we don't want to over fertilize our trees. They usually have most of what they need. Um, adding extra fertilizer unnecessarily can be bad for the trees and for the garden overall. And what about pruning? Uh, pruning is not a topic or is not a task we do a lot of in the fall. You are not going to want to structurally prune your trees. And why is that? Well, in the fall, our trees have not yet gone fully dormant. So when you cut into the living tissue, it is not going to have a chance to close over or it's going to try to close over, but not going to complete that. And it will be open in the winter and it, that tissue could be damaged by the cold temperatures. And in spring, then that tissue is more prone to infections and in insects. Uh, fall is a great time to do some maintenance pruning, which would be your dead branches. And it's really great to do it in fall because you can easily see which branches are dead, which can be really hard in the winter. So you can go ahead and remove any dead branches, clear out your trees, but save most of your, of your big pruning for winter. So after when it gets to be, you know, December, January, most of our trees have gone completely dormant. So you can go ahead and take a look at them at that time. And that's a better time to prune because you'll be able to see the structure. Um, you'll be able to tell which branches need to come off. And when spring comes, research has shown that the winter pruning, they will heal much faster when spring comes. They get a burst of growth, heal those wounds quickly, and they do much better in that regard. Um, I recommend to homeowners, one thing that you would want to reach out to a professional for is definitely tree work. Um, a lot of things that we do in the garden are things that any anyone can do, any amateur can do. We can all do basic tree, uh, basic tree pruning and or shrub pruning. But if you have any mature trees, you really want to talk to an arborist because, um, you know, if we damage a large old oak it could take 50 more years to get another large oak. It's not a, a small matter of, you know, if we have a hosta and something happens to that, we can probably get another hosta. So be really careful when you're pruning, be really mindful um, and take good care of your trees and shrubs. Okay, and our next topic is the vegetable and herb garden. So the vegetable garden is one of my favorite areas in my yard. Um, I love growing vegetables. I love growing food. I love growing fruit. I, it really brings me a lot of joy. And I can actually get a lot of vegetables well into winter. Um, we often think right now, I know I'm doing a lot of harvesting in my garden. We usually think, oh, September, we're pretty much done. But I've definitely had been able to harvest things maybe into November, maybe into December kind of depends. And it depends on how much work you want to put into this. Uh, so like I mentioned before, you plant your garlic in the in the fall. And those are the, the tiny bulbs of the garlic. Um, again, plant to the right depth. Look at how to plant it. There's all kinds of delightful garlic out there. Um, so pick one that you like. You can overwinter certain cold crops or extend your season. Even without row covers, a lot of, like I'll leave my kale out there. Um, and it will keep, kind of keep going. Um, here I have a picture of turnips and these actually taste better after they've gotten a light frost on them. So, you know, you'll want to wait and you can even harvest them that showing like an early winter snow um, for harvesting turnips. Um, if you plant, haven't planted turnips this year, it's probably a little too late. You have to sow the seeds and kind of think ahead on that one. Um, 
And in these pictures, this woman here has created sort of just this very simple row cover. Um, that's a great way to, it's like a little greenhouse. And this is a cold frame. Um, I've seen specs where people create these out of old windows, old pieces of wood, and you can really, you know, capture a lot of heat and have a little greenhouse in your yard and keep your vegetables going. Now, if you had any annual herbs outside, you could bring those inside if you want to um, and just pot them up and put them in a nice sunny windowsill. Rosemary, sage, and lavender are our perennial herbs. Those come back every year. And in fall, they might look scraggly, but you are not gonna wanna cut those all the way to the ground. You can prune off the soft herbaceous bits, but the woody bits at the bottom, you're gonna to wanna to leave that. Um, another thing you can do on your vegetable garden, if you're ready to harvest, clear it out, and get it ready for next year, is you can plant a cover crop. Oh, I think people think of cover crops as something that's done in agriculture but you can certainly do this in your home garden and I've done this. Um, so a cover crop, they also call it a green manure. Um, these are different species that help add nitrogen and organic matter to your soil. So what you do is you plant this mix in your garden and you can see this looks like a small home garden bed right here. You can plant this mix, it grows really quickly. And then when it comes spring, you till it in and that's all you have to do. And this is a great way to build the soil structure in your vegetable garden, because you're not gonna have good vegetables no matter what you do, if you don't have good soil. So there are certain species that are better to plant in the spring if you wanna use a cover crop and certain ones for the fall. I listed out some of the species here that are good for fall. Uh, I think it's Johnny's makes a mix. It's just called fall cover crop or, or fall uh, green manure or something like that. And it, it has a blend of different species that works for fall. So look at the label or pick one species if you don't want to do a mixture of species and try this in your garden. It's kind of a fun experiment. Okay, our next topic for our checklist is houseplants. Um, if you're like me, I let my houseplants go on a little summer vacation and they live outside for the summer. They seem to really like the heat and humidity. Um, but sometimes they can, if they are in an uncovered place, I have some on a porch and some out in direct, you know, sunlight and rain. So if they've gotten a lot of rain, a lot of nutrients may have washed out of their soil. Um, they could have gotten insects from being outside. So, you know, before it starts to get cold, you're going to want to maybe repot them if needed. Probably most of them will need it. And you can look for insects. This would also be a great time to fertilize um, so that they're ready for winter and bring them back in your house, um, make sure they're all cleaned up and they will be ready for your uh, winter garden, your indoor winter garden. Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about our equipment. So we've cleaned up our garden, we've done all our tasks, we're kind of ready to pack it all in for the year and be done. So what do we do with all of our equipment? Um, so we have hand tools and we have tools with engines. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about engine care as I'm sure a lot of you have some engines at home. So the main types of engines that you're gonna have for your home garden are two cycle, four cycle and diesel. I'm not really gonna talk about diesel tonight because diesel engine would probably be a ride on tractor. And I don't know, you know if, if any of you have a ride on tractor, you probably know how to take care of it where you're gonna be taking it to a specialist to get taken care of. Um, but it's important to keep in mind, you can't just leave your diesel engine out all winter. If you have one, you, you need to get it ready for winter or take it to a shop and have them help you get it ready. So I'll talk about two cycle first. Two cycle is gonna be your smaller handheld engines and that's probably gonna be in your string trimmers. So down here in the lower right, that looks like it's probably a string trimmer. Um, maybe also a chainsaw if you have a chainsaw. So what you're gonna wanna do with that is get rid of the old gas that's in there. You do not want that to sit all winter. So this person here is dumping out the gas. If you have a lot of gas, that's a good option. You need to dispose of it properly. Oh, so hopefully you have a can. You need to look up where you can take that gas when you're done. Then you're going to want to burn whatever is left in the tank off. And when you're burning gas out of a two-cycle engine, you're not going to want to run it at 
full open throttle, that's not good for the engine. So you can just let it run at idle until it's done. Then you're gonna put a little bit of fresh gas in there and some fuel stabilizer, and you're gonna run it just a, a little bit and you're gonna run that out again. Uh, the other thing you can do is take out the spark plug, put a little oil around that and put it back in. And it should be good for storage at this point. Um, and your engine will really be happy and it will give you a much longer life if you take care of it in that way. So four cycle engine is probably gonna be your push lawn mowers. And you can see here that this person is cleaning out the blades underneath. I get a lot of gunk under my mower like this. And this guy is removing the gas here. Certainly a homeowner can do this work. You can take off the blade, you can sharpen it, you can empty the gas. There's a, it's a little bit more involved than a two cycle engine. What I recommend and what I think is really handy is taking it to an equipment shop. They will take care of your engine for, it, for you and winterize it so you don't have to think about that. They'll clean it and they'll sharpen your blades for you. And I, I think it's great to have your blades professionally sharpened, especially for a lawnmower, because when spring comes, you'll just be so happy. It'll be nice and fresh and ready to go. Um, if it's a winter chore that you want to do on your own, you know, that could also be fun if that's something you enjoy doing. But I would take it to an expert and let them take care of it. Um, other tools, hand tools, you're going to clean them up. You want all the dirt and moisture off them, rust spots. You can use a wire brush. Uh, this picture is a really nice image of creating a new sharpening edge on a shovel. Your shovel and spade should be nice and sharp and rust free. You could put a little oil on them if you'd like and store them in a dry and clean place for the winter. And one tool I do want to talk about specifically for getting ready for winter, and you probably would do this a couple of times a year, is the bypass pruners. Um, now, I've talked a little bit about equipment, how you don't need fancy equipment for gardening. You know, I really think that's true. I think you can go with the basics. But one tool I think every home gardener should have is a nice pair of bypass pruners. Um, don't skimp out here. They're not really that expensive. Even a good pair can be, I want to say, 30, 40 bucks. I don't think that's bad. And if you take care of them, they'll last you forever. Now, uh, the gold standard in horticulture is Falco. Um, I actually have mine here. I, I think you can see me. Um, we actually use these so much. We carry them in a holster because uh, we're just constantly using these. Um, let me find, I have my sharpener here because I wanted to show you a little bit can about you put it a little higher, Jen. Can, How's yeah. that? Yeah, like hold it toward in front of your face almost. Yeah, just toward. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Okay. So you can see an image there of the sharpener, and we just got these sharpeners and started using them. They work really well, um, and they're really easy because they even have a diagram on the back of how to sharpen it. So when you sharpen your bypass pruners, you're only going to sharpen the beveled edge of the blade. And that's going to be your cutting edge here. You don't want to you don't want to sharpen the flattened back because that's actually going to dull your blade. So you're going to the best way to hold them is kind of like this, and you're going to go along with the angle that's already there. You don't want to create a new angle, and you just sharpen it. You just go along with your sharpener. And you just go along the edge following the same angle that's already there. The only time you're going to go on the back is if you've created a burr and you're just going to use the flat edge to sort of get that burr out of there. And then if you keep these cleaned and oiled, these will last for many, many years. These are Felco. There's a lot of other really good brands out there. Um, very useful tool in the garden. You know, we talked a little bit about pruning, cutting back your plants in the spring and fall and it's really gonna be useful to you. So now our fall checklist is done. We've put our tools away and we're ready to think about winter. I think this is an important thing to do for every homeowner, I always do this. Don't wait for the last minute. We know we can get a snowfall maybe in November. I usually do this like beginning of November-ish. Um, so you'll wanna pull out your snowblower if you have one 
and you know it might be under the pool and the kayak and all the summer stuff so you're going to want to bring this to the front and move your summer stuff back if it's battery powered like this one here make sure where are the batteries where's the charger get that ready have it handy start it up does it work that way you have time if it doesn't work you can take it to the shop and they might be able to get it fixed before the big snowfall comes um, if you have a gas one hopefully you did some of those other chores that we talked about for our other mowers, for the mower and things like that. Hopefully you did that when winter was over and your blower is ready to go. If not, start it up, check it out, drain out the gas, put fresh gas, make sure you have gas, go fill your gas can, be ready to go. Check your shovels, make sure they're not broken, put them near the door, um, put one up by the porch, one by the front porch, one by the back porch, one by the garage. And then get some eco-friendly ice melt. Um, salt is not good for your garden. Um, they have these many other products that are a lot more eco-friendly. They're going to be good for your garden and for your pets if you have pets and just good for the environment overall. Okay, so that pretty much brings me to the end of my checklist. Um, I have a couple things here I want to talk about as far as research and resources. Um, I listed some great resources here. One thing I'll say about that, when you're looking for information online, look for reputable sources and look for resources from our area. This is the uh, U of I Extension, Missouri Botanical Garden, Chicago Botanic Garden, and the Morton Arboretum. Their advice is gonna be for plants of the Midwest and gardens of the Midwest. You wouldn't wanna look for something from like Arizona or California that might not be pertaining to our area. They have lots of great things on these websites. I really love them. Um, any questions you might have about specific plants, you can ask here, find out here, find great articles. And I have a couple book recommendations too. This book on the right is a wonderful book for a home gardener. It's like a Bible. It has so much information about all kinds of plants. Um, I think everyone who has a home garden should have that. It's, it's just fantastic. The other two books on the left are maybe fun books for your winter reading. If you um, think you're going to want to be talking about or thinking about your garden and sitting by a window drinking a cup of tea. This book is really beautiful, The Heirloom Gardener. It has lots of great artwork and stories in it. Um, and this other book down here, if you're into trees, which I'm very much into trees, this is a small field guide. It's also a pocket guide. You could take this out hiking with you. You could just read up on trees. So a lot of native trees are in there. Um, these are trees you might see, you know, out in the forest or whatever, but they're also trees you could use in your landscape. So you can learn about some of the cultural requirements in there as well. Oops. Okay, so that is the end of my presentation. Um, we're gonna turn it over for any questions. I left my email here if you have any questions or you wanna chat about anything garden related, um, feel free to reach out. Awesome, yeah. Oh, sorry, Judy, were you jumping yeah, go ahead. Okay. Take it away. Perfect. Well, thank you, Jen. It's been um, such a pleasure to uh, learn from you today. I think that was just an extremely helpful and, and comprehensive um, presentation. So really um, just want to thank you for that. Um, we do have quite a few questions in the chat for you. So um, I'll kind of start at the top and we'll we'll try to go by category um, kind of in the same flow as your presentation. So um, kind of in the in the topic of dividing plants and just a little bit more general. Um, the, the first question really is from Christy, and um, what is the average date that the ground freezes in our area? So just thinking about um, when to take care of that uh, dividing plants. That really depends. I would, this is my educated guess on that. I don't have, you know, the farmer's almanac dates on that. I do know our first frost is usually a date we, we know and we can look at, and that's usually in October. I think the ground usually freezes near the end of November towards the beginning of December. I would definitely look at that as your guideline for uh, dividing your plants. Very helpful. And um, when dividing plants, um, if they're really tall, can we cut them down to make them more manageable? Yeah, I think that you could, especially if they're hardy plants and you're finding some difficulty in doing that. However, what I would keep in mind is that that plant, that plant tissue may continue to um, have photosynthesis as the, years, as the months go by until it goes dormant. So 
if you cut back that tissue, it's not sending as much um, sugars to the roots for winter. That may or may not be a problem depending on the hardiness of the plant. And sometimes when you divide plants, they are going to look bad for the rest of the year. And that's that sort of like planning for the future. Like I know these are going to look weird and floppy, but come spring, they should come up hardy and fresh. And really, the, I think the last question in dividing plants is um, from Gila, and um, she's just not totally clear on why to divide plants. Is it something you have to do, or is it really just for certain perennials? There are certain perennials where it's recommended, and you don't have to do it. They'll probably continue to live, but for their optimal vigor, yes, there are certain perennials that you would really want to divide at least every few years. Some can grow the way they are, you know, for any amount of time. It also depends on their habit. If they're a bit woody, you know, we're not talking about woody plants that you're going to be dividing in half. These are more like your herbaceous perennials that where you can really see, oh, I see many more plants. These are the ones I'm going to divide. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, so we'll sh sort of shift gears um, more in the fall bulbs um, kind of category. So um, first question here is from Sue. I think a question on a lot of folks mind, how to protect the bulbs from um, animals such as squirrels? Do your best. Um, I've heard all sorts of home remedies for this. Um, my best advice is plant a lot of bulbs. You know, plant like double the amount of bulbs you want. Um, you know, I've heard people put shave up Irish spring soap. Apparently animals don't like that. Um, and it doesn't do anything bad to your garden. Some people put cinnamon, some people put cayenne pepper. I, I don't think that you can do anything about it. Again, this is a working with nature, not against nature. And I think it's one of those things about gardening in an urban environment that we have to accept that there's a lot of squirrels. So I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. <laughs> No, that's really helpful. Yeah, appreciate that. So um, Sue, let us know of any other questions, but um, hopefully that points us in the right direction. Um, and then Christy asked, um, can bulbs be planted in beds with perennials and or annuals, or will they not like the regular watering throughout the summer? No, they can be mixed in. Yep, that's, that's totally fine. In fact, that's really lovely because then your garden has maybe an area with the bulbs. Um, or, you know, the bulbs can rise through, you know, you might have your bulbs growing here and your perennials kind of growing around it. And then when those bulbs sort of die back, then the annuals surround it, the bulbs go under the ground for the rest of the summer, never to be seen again until spring. So yes, they can all be mixed into one garden bed. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, and then Bill um, just had a comment. So um, he said one caution about alliums that he's experienced is that the smaller ones can get out of hand over time um, and the larger ones have not had this problem, but the small ones can divide very vigorously. Do you have any comments or any tips about that? Well, if they divide and you don't want them, you can always dig them up and give them to your friends. Um, I like a lot of allium, so that wouldn't be a problem for me, but I could understand if you didn't want that going into one area of your garden bed, uh, that could be a problem. So call me up and I'll, I'll take them off your hands. All right, Bill, you heard that. So <laughs> definitely get, get in touch. Um, and then again, sort of shifting to the next uh, category here. So kind of in shredding leaves. Um, Christy is wondering um, if we shred or run over leaves with the lawnmower before putting them uh, where we want them for the winter, does that harm or destroy any insects? And I'm, I'm guessing we're wondering about sort of beneficial insects. Yeah, that's a great question. And people have talked about that. Um, I'm A lot of the insects are so small that yes, you may be damaging some of them, but you're probably not damaging all of them. They're probably still clinging to the leaf somewhere. Again, this is, you know, your, it's always a better option than putting it in the bag and taking it away and getting rid of those insects. In that case, you're getting rid of those insects altogether. So you're hedging your bets that you're keeping that matter. You're hopefully not harming all of the insects in there by shredding it. And you're kind of doing your best methods to preserve the environment and preserve those insects. So, but that is a good question. Fantastic, thank you. 
And then um, Sue um, had asked if you can shred leaves in the fall with the lawnmower. I think you said yes. And then you gave a few other options, um, mulching mower, chipper shredder, et cetera. Um, so I, I think you pretty much answered that question, but if you have any other comments on that, um, I'm sure Sue would appreciate that as well. Yeah, you can, you can shred those up by all those methods that I mentioned. Also, I, I have had it where I didn't have time to shred them in the fall. I just shred them in the spring, but you want to be sure that you remove them before your plants come up. If you do have a layer of wet leaves on your garden in spring, that needs to come out before anything comes up. Because if you rake out uh, those wet leaves, you're going to be damaging the small shoots that are coming up. So if you, if you don't get around to shredding them and you have whole leaves on your garden, get them out, rake them onto your lawn, let them dry and shred them at that point. I, I hope I answered that. Yeah, and I think you kind of answered the next question as well, which was um, from Margaret, and she said, um, you mentioned, you know, that if leaves are not broken down enough in the spring, you leave them, um, but how do we know if the leaves are broken down enough, and what are we looking for? And I think you kind of touched on that, um, kind of what to look for, but yeah. I so. go, that, that picture that I had of a person holding some leaves in their hand, about that level of structure would be good, where it has air within it where you don't see flat surfaces of leaves kind of being together. So, you know, where they're gonna break down, get air and not cause a mat of leaves on your garden would be appropriate level of shredding. Perfect. And um, kind of the last question in that sort of category is from Judy N. Um, Judy has two peony plants that are not growing um, and is thinking maybe it's from her uh, neighbor's pine needles that are landing in the soil. Um, could that be the case and what's really the best time to dig them up and move them? Peonies are one of the ones I believe that you would move in the fall. Um, you would have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure that those are ones you can move in the fall. And with the pine needles, you may also want to get your soil tested. The pine needles can make your soil acidic. I don't know how many pine needles are there and how many are underneath. You could always plant something that's an acid loving plant under there, like blueberries, azalea, something of that nature. So that's what I would recommend working with in that location. Great tip, thank you. Um, and then shifting to cover crops. So Christy asked, um, in a vegetable garden, how do you manage cover crops that are, are mixed in with weeds once the spring arrives? That's a good question. I wouldn't plant the cover crops until you had removed the weeds. Hopefully you don't have too many mixed in there. Um, if, if your weeds haven't gone to seeds and they don't have spreading roots, you can go ahead and just dig them in with the cover crop. If your weeds have grown up and they have seeds, then you'll probably just wanna get rid of everything in there because you do not wanna continue to spread seeds. Good to know. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then I think the last question we have actually here in the chat is um, it's from iPhone user. So um, feel free to put your name in the chat. But um, they ask, uh, we seem to have spots of dead lawn that may be fungal. How do you know if it's not due to dog urine? Is there kind of a way to differentiate? That is a good question. You can look at the blades of grass. Um, see if they sometimes certain fungal infections on grass can show like um, a rust which would be like a powdery sort of material on it or like some spotting um, usually if it's dog urine it's just going to look totally yellow um, the only definitive diagnosis is it, it, technically to look at it under a microscope and look for fungal spores but really an expert person in turf would be able to look at it and tell um, yeah, I would check that out. If you need to, you can dig out that area of turf, reseed it, um, fertilize the area and see if it comes back again. It, it depends on the size of it, too, the size of the patch too, how much work you want to put into it. Um, or you can call tur turf expert to come look at that too. Very helpful. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, Judy, I, I think that's all we had in the chat. So I will, I will pass it back to you. Great. Um, first of all, Thank you, thank you, thank you. This is one of the hardest working women in our community. Um, she is out there every day in making our parks beautiful. So um, that Jen agreed to do this talk um, It's all fresh material. And we, we had a big ask 
um, doing this first ever type of presentation with our fall. We wanted to just cover everything. So um, there was a lot of information that you covered and we're so grateful for you taking the time to um, share it with us tonight. Um, our FOPCON um, website does have um, deep dives on planting garlic. Um, we had a whole Dahlia talk. So I'll send the link out um, and when we do our follow-up email um, after this presentation. Um, at this point, I would like to invite, if there's any more questions, there's just a few of us here. So if you do want to unmute and ask any other questions, we can keep it going for a couple more minutes. Um, otherwise, we'll wrap up. Um, I know uh, as gardeners, we are uh, always wanting to maximize our time out there. And today was just really hard. It was oppressive to be outdoors. And uh, I actually got out and watered. I know you guys were out watering and doing things early. Weren't you there at like 6 a.m.? Yeah, everyone started at 6 yeah. for the last few days. And that was our primary goal was watering. Yeah. And yeah. we did a little bit of weeding, but yeah. gardening and all those indoor chores, sharpening yes. the tools, oh, going good. to store to buy more tools. Yeah. Okay. That sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it was just, uh, you know, lots of information. So anybody want to say hi, you can unmute. We have Uncorked coming up. We have a plant and tool exchange happening. The help desk, if you have more questions about what to do, um, lots of resources. And um, our, our fall programs are hydrangeas in September. And then our carnivorous plant talk, which is going to be very interesting. I think we have a couple of master gardeners coming up um, for those next two. Um, I, I did want to say one thing. This is the, yeah. who the question about the squirrels and the bulbs. What we have found that works, I just asked the question to see if you had another alternative. We use chicken wire and we put a little piece okay. of it over where we plant the bulbs with a couple of little rocks to hold it in place. And as long as you get that out in the spring, they usually can't get in there. I know there's some other ideas about putting them in little plastic holders and things like that, but uh, the chicken wire has worked well for us because we had a whole front of our house absolutely eaten by the squirrels and never saw a tulip there. So we got a little mad about that. <laughs> Sue is our um, president of the board for the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. So <laughs> her garden is gorgeous. So thank you for sharing that. And I also see um, Susie Narcus is on tonight. Susie is um, the champion who works with me on planning all of these talks and lectures. She is amazing. Um, and she and Janice um, Roberts, who are on, are planning the um, seed swap and um, seed starting lecture that will happen in January. So that's coming back. We're just so excited to have all these new programs um, returning uh, for fall. And um, anybody else have any other questions? Otherwise, we'll wrap up. I will be at Uncorked tomorrow, so we can talk gardening then. Um, there... I have a question. Hi, oh, this is ahead. Monica. Oh, hi, Monica. Um, I have a hi. Um, I have a brand new native garden in my front yard, and so this is going to be my first fall with it. Any tips for little tiny baby plugs that I just planted in the spring? Yeah, I would keep watering those throughout the fall. Um, cut back your watering. Don't water them every day, but certainly in hot heat like this, water them every day. Again, a very good example of working with nature. You want them to develop deeper roots. So you do not want to water them every day unless it's hot and give them good deep waterings. So maybe in this heat, you watered them every day to keep them going. Once it starts to cool off, cut back on your waterings maybe go every third day, then go every fourth day, every fifth day, but water them really deep so they, they can really send down those shoots and really develop a good deep root system.